uh, a beautiful fall evening and spend a couple of hours on a what some people regard as a little bit of an esoteric subject. Uh, that is what's going on in our area with the emerald ash borer infestation. It's an important issue and you probably wouldn't be here but that you recognize that. Uh, we hope at the end of the evening though, uh, we've given you a detailed idea of what's going on and what this workshop is really about uh, is to actually be, um, to give you some practical alternatives about analyzing what you may have on your own private property or if you are an institutional landowner of some kind, a corporate landowner, uh, and you have ash trees there, we wanna give you an idea of what's going on there and what options you have available to you. Um, I've been with the Sheboygan Rotary Club just about 20 years now, Tony Fessler, and sit on the board of the Rotary Club. Um, we are partnered, as I think you perhaps know from some of our material, with an organization that's also represented uh, here tonight, the Lakeshore Natural Resource Partnership. And at the moment we have two, and I think soon to be three of their representatives, Jim Kettler in the back, uh, who I will bail me out when I say something I shouldn't perhaps, and has forgotten more about a lot of what we're doing perhaps than I am, that he's uh, uh, somebody who works full time in the ecology conservation area. Uh, their network stems from uh, Ozaki and Milwaukee all the way north to Door County and then inland, what would you say, Jim, 100 miles? Yeah, well, Calumet County and Southeastern uh, Very, very active uh, set of partnerships they have, not just in Sheboygan County, but we're fortunate to have them as a partner to work with us technically. And then uh, Kendra Kelling in the back, who is really the project officer in many respects that has devoted a lot of time to working on the uh, Emerald Ash Borer. And she's also a great wealth of knowledge and energy that has uh, helped us get this program off the, the ground. We have three things, oh, and I guess the other thing I absolutely need to do is uh, thank uh, Maywood and Dave Cookook, uh, who is with us tonight. Dave uh, is also a great supporter of what we're doing uh, and kind of a, a, a partner in this enterprise as well and has helped with us in, try to, in trying to provide uh, information to uh, not only uh, the folks that are here this evening, uh, but the younger members of our community doing a lot of education in the schools and many things that Maywood is involved in. So um, we are fortunate to have a number of people pulling in the same direction uh, that we are. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, present to you for about 20, 25 minutes at most. Um, we are then going to have the city forester with the city of Sheboygan, uh, who's with us, uh, Bull, uh, who will give you a presentation, which I think is illustrative of what's being done on a government basis to deal with the Emerald Ash for what they are doing, uh, what they have done historically, um, what their objectives are, what their resources are that are available to them, how they're trying to redirect resources. And I think frankly, with this group, equally important, he will tell you about what these municipalities aren't going to do. Um, it's not that they don't want to, but they have limited resources. So we find that most of the folks we talk to who are private landowners, institutional landowners, think that this is completely the government's problem um, and they don't have to do anything about it. The government's gonna come in and resolve all. And while we, I'm, it's good we have great confidence in government and we have some really good people working on it, the, the truth of the matter is, and I hope if you leave with nothing else, you'll understand at the end of the evening, the government simply can't resolve this whole problem. We have to get the public engaged in it, people uh, like uh, you folks that are with us this evening. So it's important, I think, to hear his presentation and just looking at what Sheboygan, which is particularly well-resourced, I might say, to deal with this problem and where they are with it, where they're going, and what you as individual landowners need to do and also helping us get this message out to the public. And then finally, we have Bob Gluck. Bob uh, is... Uh, um, you've been involved in a variety of contractual work in dealing with emerald ash borer and many other tree diseases. Uh, first with his own business and now with the Hoppy um, organization out of, is it Milwaukee, Bob, or yeah, West Allis? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and they're very, they probably of all the contractors, at least in this part of the state of Wisconsin, there is no contractor more engaged and more knowledgeable about tree diseases and certainly the emerald ash borer. So we've asked Bob 
to give you an idea of options that are open to you, frankly, what the costs may be, um, what risks are out there. Um, Bob will probably point out that emerald ash borer is not the only thing you're going to be dealing with, but obviously I've got him focused tonight particularly on the EAB problem. Okay, as we go along, uh, there are essentially no rules here. This is a workshop. So if you want to interrupt, you disagree with something a speaker says, or you want to ask a question, uh, we would welcome, uh, we'd welcome, of course, those questions or comments from you. The first time we did this back in June, we had quite a bit of engagement. Um, and as my dad, an old trial lawyer in Sheboygan, would say, there is no stupid question except the one that's never asked. So please uh, be involved with this and we'll all learn, I think, from questions. It usually means that we're not covering some area that we, that we should be. Um, as we get started, any other comments, Dave? Anything I've forgotten here or, okay. Uh, I'm, I have a brief presentation which I'll try to get us through. Uh, again, our objective is to get you out of here on time. Uh, the consortium that we have here, which I've referred to, is called Restoration of Our Trees Sheboygan. It's been in operation just about a year now. Um, it operates based on a cooperative memorandum of understanding that the Sheboygan Rotary Club negotiated, if you would, with our partner, Lakeshore Natural Resource Partnership. And we come together under this acronym, Roots or Restoration of Our Trees Sheboygan. Again, LNRP provides the technical know-how, a lot of the staffing capacity that they have since they have Kendra and Jim and other members of their team as full-time staff. Um, and then the Rotary Organization has uh, about 100 members. Uh, we meet once a week um, and we then provide, we hope, the networking capacity and capability here to focus on this problem in the Sheboygan County area. Roots is by its definition designed to look at emerald ash borer in Sheboygan County. Not that the ash borer uh, don't jump the county lines and go into Manitowoc and Fond du Lac, of course they do, but we've picked a geographical area and we're focused on that uh, as well. I might say that what we've been trying to do here is of great interest, particularly to the Wisconsin DNR, because if we are successful in energizing the public and the corporate side, the private side, if you would, of what we have here in Sheboygan County with both uh, knowledge-based um, and, and also with um, financial capability. Um, it will be a great help, we think, to the municipalities and to the county governments here in combating what is a massive uh, ecological problem. So the DNR is uh, a, great, uh, a great help to us and um, we actually have some considerable DNR financial support for what we're doing, a grant that Jim and Kendra have applied for at LNRP that we received received a year ago uh, that is helping with urban planning um, and uh, particularly we're working in the townships that have really no capacity uh, for evaluating EAB within their areas and don't have forestry plans. Uh, Jim and Kendra and the staff at LNRP and some volunteers are working in that area. Uh, the DNR, as I said, has funded, at least modestly funded that effort right now, which is well underway. And I guess we, we've, you, so far you are working in actively in five townships, thereabouts. And we hope to get to the remaining ones as well. So that's what Roots is. Um, we have a website and uh, you can reach us without any difficulty. I guess I'm told this clicker works, so we'll See if I can, there we go. Um, the, the origin of the emerald ash borer, many of you may know this already. Uh, this is a scary looking uh, depiction of the actual um, beetle itself. Actually, it uh, fits uh, about half, if you have a penny, it's about half the size of a penny. And it's, I think, half inch or less. So it's really a very tiny animal, despite the fact it uh, looks a little scary. As best anyone knows, um, it, uh, the origin of it was probably in Western Asia and China and Korea. It uh, arrived in the Detroit area, we think about um, the turn of the century, maybe 2001, 2002. It uh, most likely came in pallets from China on container ships. And unfortunately, before anybody in uh, lower Michigan realized what was going on, this thing uh, had metastasized and had spread all over initially the Detroit and Dearborn area and then 
uh, within a fairly short period of time had expanded throughout much of the Midwest and uh, obviously arrived in, in Wisconsin as well. This is the life cycle uh, of, the, of the bug, if you would, um, and we can start, I suppose, with the eggs down here on the lower uh, right. Um, they're small, kind of a reddish brown color, very, very tiny, as you can see there, if you can read that, one millimeter in size, very hard to spot. Um, the eggs hatch uh, after a period of time and turn into that ugly larvae you see over there on the lower left, a segmented kind of thing. I'm passing out uh, a vial that has an example of a full grown larvae there. You might have a look at that. Uh, and that's the critter that really does the damage. It gets inside uh, the bark in the outer area of ash trees and I, it seems to focus on the ash. I've been asked whether um, the bug actually uh, infests other trees and I, as far as I know, it's just the ash. Uh, God help us if it, if, uh, you know, uh, expands beyond that. But at the moment we're dealing with the ash and then it forms those galleries which uh, you'll see in another slide and which are also depicted in that example that I'm putting out. And of course that's what kills the tree because the tree can't get its natural nutrients. Um, over winter then, of course, the uh, thing turns into this pubate uh, stage in the wood bark um, and then it presents, of course, as the actual adult beetle itself, which is, of course, what you tend to see and hear about. And, of course, that animal bores into the uh, tree again and the cycle starts over, lays its eggs. It uh, metastasizes and expands very, very quickly. Uh, so we're usually talking about one to two years in terms of the life cycle development. Is that am I, I'm right on that in terms of the city's understanding of what's going on? That's my understanding of the life cycle. So um, the thing, as I said, is very hard to kill. It isn't a matter of spraying the trees. Um, Sheboygan, for those of you who are my age and have as much gray hair as I do, will remember, of course, the Dutch elm disease problem where I can remember as a kid in Sheboygan spraying the trees with DDT, which right now wouldn't be a real good idea, but we didn't know that at that time. Um, and so obviously, I don't know if DDT would be effective on these things, it probably would, it's effective on us. But we're obviously the city and the municipalities and the government can't go spraying these trees with that kind of a strong uh, pesticide. So quite frankly, the bad news is there is very little that you can do about this except to treat the tree individually. And Bob Gluck um, and Tim will talk a little bit about the process and how they actually treat the trees. There are some options, but it's not the sort of thing where we can overfly vast areas of forest land and, and treat it. Um, I said it was a small beetle, and it, there's a depiction on a, uh, on a penny. It shows you how small the thing is. And, of course, those are examples that, are, that we're passing out. And, again, what the, the galleries look like on the right, and then the segmented uh, larvae itself. Flat-headed uh, kind of larvae. Again, very hard to see. They tend to be small. If you peel back the bark of an infested tree, you probably will see those ugly galleries where, of course, what's happening is the bug is killing the tree uh, by, um, in effect, consuming and interrupting the life cycle or the, or the flow of the material up and down the tree. Okay, some indications of what happens when this occurs. Um, for one thing, you get dead branches towards the top of the tree, usually first or early on, and the, uh, the epicormic sprouting, as they say in the upper left-hand corner, you see the S-shaped galleries under the bark. Um, the bark has a tendency to split. If you see any of that on your property with trees and you look carefully, you probably have it. There are numerous examples that I see throughout uh, this area. And if you, before all the leaves fall off the trees, the next time any of you drive down to Milwaukee on the interstate during the daytime, once you get about as far as um, Cedar Grove, not Cedarburg, Cedar Grove, and you look to the left and right, you will see vast areas of woods that are denuded, that have no leaves. Those are ash trees that have been killed by this thing. Uh, we, it hasn't, of course, uh, spread north as yet uh, in significant amounts to Sheboygan, at least isn't manifesting itself yet. But our areas up here are gonna look just like that in a matter of a year or two. And I'm gonna show you, um, again, a, um, 
a uh, graph that has been uh, uh, provided to us by the DNR that will show you the life cycle and how this thing takes Im impact. You can see in the lower right woodpecker damage. The woodpeckers get at these larvae and eggs when they can, uh, but they, we don't have enough woodpeckers to, <laughs> to deal with the emerald ash borer. Um, again, examples of the larvae and the exit holes um, once the eggs develop and the, the beetle itself is fully developed, it exits through a kind of a D-shaped hole in the tree. And as I, you look at some of these samples that we are passing around, which came both from uh, Maywood here, Dave's helped us with that, and also from the DNR, it'll give you an idea of what this thing, the damage it does and what it looks like. Sorry. Okay, um, what about the spread? And I said well, this whole thing, as far as we can tell, started in Detroit. Um, this is what's happened in Wisconsin. In 2008, you see the single dot, at least that's the one the DNR knew about, which is down, I guess that would be in the Ozaki area. Okay, thanks. And we're going to show you some photographs of what that area looks like right now. Um, did everybody hear what Bob said? as to where it was, okay. And then uh, you take a look at where we were uh, in uh, 2018 and you can see how the thing has expanded and exploded into particularly eastern Wisconsin but is working its way west. Uh, interestingly enough, um, of course, it's moved largely by uh, f firewood being moved by human beings. So the thing has spread all over the place. It's uh, hasn't, at least as of 2018, the detections are limited in the northern part of the state, but it's a matter of time uh, until it works its way north into the state. And as you can see, Sheboygan County, Ozaki, Milwaukee are heavily infested at this point uh, with, with the emerald ash borer itself. And these are, again, indications of where the DNR has detected the bug. There may be places they haven't detected that it's located as well. Um, they have a ban on moving firewood, and that's certainly slowing it. The other question I frequently get in these sessions is, well, you read last summer or last winter we had this, these very, very cold Arctic conditions um, over a period of time, and there were uh, indications in the newspapers that um, the University of Minnesota and University of Michigan said that was killing um, the larvae and was killing the eggs, and it, didn't that put an end to all of this? Well, it helped. It has slowed down the infestation rate, uh, but the DNR will be quick to tell you that that's all it's done. It's slowed it down and it will come back. And I guess if you uh, look at the science of, uh, if you would, uh, that's going on here, um, in effect, the bugs and the eggs that make it through that, if anything, are the tougher ones. Uh, and as they procreate, if anything, the, the disease over time will probably even get stronger through the process of natural selection. I'm a lawyer, by the way, and not a biologist. You'll guess if you haven't already guessed that. So I will depend on the more science folks here to bail me out if I say something wrong. But basically, um, it's a good news, bad news situation when we have a, uh, have a cold winter. Slows it down but it, the bugs and the eggs that make it through, if anything, are more lethal than ever. So it's no ultimate solution here. And even though we may have another cold winter, I don't know. This is what our organization looks like. I'm, we're not gonna talk too much about that. If you wanna know more, go to our website or talk with us afterwards. But essentially, uh, the LNRP and the Rotary have come together to do three things. Uh, implementation of an investment fund. We're trying to raise money through private um, and corporate money that would then be available to the city of Sheboygan, the county, and municipalities throughout Sheboygan County to buy trees, to um, non-ash trees, obviously, uh, to create a more diverse uh, population of trees, particularly in the municipalities. Uh, they, what you're going to learn from the city is they just simply don't have the budget resources to do everything that they need to do. They're going to be cutting more trees down than they're going to be planting, not because they don't want to do something about it, but there are limitations as to what they can do. And I won't deal, I won't steal the, uh, the city's uh, thunder on that one, but I, to me that's something that should be an attention getter for you. Um, so we're trying through this Roots organization to raise resources um, that are not government-based to try to do something about it. 
I use an old Navy term of mine as a retired Naval officer. I say it's a matter of uh, trying to get all hands on deck. We need the public engaged. We need private organizations engaged. Um, Maywood obviously is helping and we need organizations like Maywood to step up and, and certainly David and Maywood are doing that. Uh, but we've got to get this word out to the public. By and in large, quite frankly, the public doesn't know what's going on here. Um, we still don't completely have the media's attention. Um, WHBL has been very helpful uh, to us and we're going to continue to work with them. Uh, the two no-cost uh, newspapers in Sheboygan, the Beacon and the Sun um, are helping us. Um, I haven't had much success with the other major newspaper in the area. I'm working on that. <laughs> I haven't got their, their attention. Apparently Gannett is not terribly interested as yet in the problem. Uh, but we're trying to get them engaged. And I realize I'm on Channel 8 right now, so we'll see if this makes any difference. Uh, we do appreciate Channel 8 being with us and helping us as well. But we've got to get this uh, message out to the media and out to the public at large as to how devastating this thing is going to be for us. We'll get into a little bit more of that. Then the other part of what we're doing is the planning and urban forestry grants. And LNRP is the lead on that. They've done a wonderful job uh, of bringing in resources. Uh, they've got the DNR involved and uh, we're about to, I don't know if we can go public yet, but they're about to go public on one or two additional grants. These are government-based grants that will bring in resources to Sheboygan County that wouldn't otherwise be here, but for the grant writing that Kendra and Jim have done with LNRP, for which I'm most, um, uh, most appreciative, and it's gonna make a difference there. there. We're trying to do things that wouldn't otherwise be done in planting, planning and planting eventually trees so to bring uh, bring those special resources in here that will help the county and uh, if there's time later Kendra and Jim can maybe talk a little bit about that and finally what you're involved with tonight which is to attempt to engage the community in matters of uh, urban forestry and knowledge about what's going on because the average person on the street at least we're running into throughout Sheboygan County, just still doesn't understand the nature of this infestation, that it's at least uh, as bad as what we put up with in the 1950s uh, with the Dutch elm disease, which was devastating to Sheboygan. Any of you, as I said, that are, have been around as long as I have will remember uh, the impact that had on the city of Sheboygan and Plymouth and Kohler and other places as well. Um, Basically, this is a slide I'll let you look at. I'm not going to read it all to you, but the bottom line is um, that trees are good for public health. Um, they make a great difference. It shows you the extent of ash trees uh, in the area um, and what they do in terms of removal of pollutants and with their contribution of uh, inserting, if you would, oxygen and removing, of course, carbon dioxide. And for anybody that, and I hope most of this uh, group probably is concerned about global warming and some of the implications of global warming. Um, there is probably no better way to deal with that, quite frankly, than to increase the population of trees and to uh, enhance the, uh, the uh, uh, if you would, the number of trees that we have in any given area. So this is a positive thing. Uh, in terms of dealing with it. The, the disease and isn't, but certainly replanting trees and maintaining a healthy tree canopy is absolutely critical here. Um, you can see some of the data. There's a lot here about what an individual tree can do in terms of capturing rainwater, uh, reducing flooding, and we've certainly seen plenty of that in this part of Wisconsin. Um, you increase the number of trees, it helps with that runoff. Um, and of course, uh, the, the, as I said, generally just uh, is a positive factor in terms of reduction of air pollution. And you can put that into dollar numbers, which is what this slide does. I'm not gonna read all of that to you. And it's uh, widely understood that a large tree canopy is good for public health across the board. So that's one of the major benefits. We're trying to get that message out that it makes a difference in terms of healthy environment. Um, and then um, we're also trying to make the case, I guess, particularly for our corporate donor community and private uh, concerns as well, foundations, that tree-filled neighborhoods are certainly safer, more pleasant places, um, actually demonstrates that uh, uh, communities with 
uh, large tree canopies are more pleasant places, believe it or not. I guess they tell me that uh, if you have them in malls, people buy more and feel <laughs> more inclined to go to a mall. Not that we're promoting necessarily consumerism, but there is actually a, a, f a connection there for all of that. So it, uh, and, and what we do find is Wisconsin's attractive place for the workforce here in many respects because of what trees do for us in our overall environment in terms of uh, sporting activities and just the aesthetics of the state. Um, if uh, I have a daughter right at the moment that is in, uh, involved uh, in working with a government project and she is in uh, located in eastern Washington. I don't know how many of you people have driven into eastern Washington, um, but there aren't many trees and it's not a very pleasant place. And uh, I talked to her just earlier today. She actually wishes she could be back here. It's just not aesthetically a very pleasing place and has its real limitations. So we're, we're, ple you know, we're really privileged in Wisconsin to have the beautiful tree canopy and um, all of the wonderful things that just are exhibited right outside here tonight in Maywood. Um, much of that tree canopy is now at risk. Um, again, I won't read the slide to you, but um, just uh, generally a, a very positive impact. The other argument we make as we talk to folks is that there are actually dollar and cents uh, advantages to having a healthy tree canopy. Uh, you can see what some of those are. You can put dollar numbers on that. It certainly saves on the cooling bill in the summer if you're air conditioning. Um, and even if you're not, it makes it a more pleasant environment and cooler. And then in the winter, it actually saves, uh, trees will save uh, heating costs. And you can see what some of those numbers look like. Plus, uh, it's demonstrated, and I think any realtor will tell you, that uh, a healthy tree canopy on a piece of individual property enhances the value of the property itself. So in addition to all the good vi environmental things it does, uh, it over a lifetime uh, can have quite a, a difference in terms of heating and cooling costs. Um, and if you don't have trees, you do end up with, I guess, the eastern Washington environment, which isn't the best, I guess, for what we want to do here. Again, I'm not going to, in the interest of time, I won't read all of that to you, and we can certainly make these slides available uh, if you would like. Public recreation is something we like to talk a lot about because most Wisconsinites have one or more forms of public education that they're in love with, whether you are a fisherman or a hunter. Um, Dave just come back from a terrific canoeing trip, although I guess it wasn't in Wisconsin. He went up to Lake Superior. Uh, but we certainly have those wonderful opportunities in Wisconsin that in, in terms of our rivers, um, if you like to bike, if you like to jog, uh, trees are almost a critical part of every form of public education. Uh, so we need them. And uh, what you're, I'm about to tell you is that a very, very high percentage of our tree population in Wisconsin is now at risk as a result of this. It's why we're talking about it because we have such a high population of ash trees that we're trying to do something about. This is an example of an area, um, it, this happens to be the uh, Toledo, um, before the emerald ash borer uh, struck. And as you can see, it's a beautiful tree. It reminds me a little of the old days in Sheboygan when we had the, before the Dutch elm disease and then what happened. And that's what it looks like after the disease has had its impact, pretty dramatic. Um, it takes about a year or two once this thing is infested in area uh, to change from what you did see uh, to this area uh, that is presented in this slide. And you notice the grass is green here, so it isn't a matter of our tricking you by taking slides that, that were in the deepest, partis, darkest part of the winter. Uh, so we're in an area where those trees should be foliated, and they're not. I don't know how much of this shows up on Channel 8, but... Uh, uh, hopefully viewers will be, get some idea here. Um, again, city of Toledo now, I will agree that this is a winter shot, so you wouldn't expect to see foliated trees, certainly, uh, in that area. And if it's the shot, I think it is. This is an area after those trees have been removed. And once the tree is completely infected, it has to be cut down. And you're going to hear a little bit about what the city's doing right now in Sheboygan because they have to and what their plans are. But it's, it's quite a difference from uh, the aesthetics of a neighborhood that has a, a nice tree canopy and what happens in the aftermath of this thing. 
Again, more of these sorts of shots here. Um, I don't know if, if this was Toledo or not. And then that's the aftermath of how ugly it is after those trees have been removed. And as this infestation moves into our area, and we're right on the cusp of it right now, uh, you're going to see plenty of that. So what Roots is trying to do here with our uh, public grants, our government grants, what we're trying to raise from private resources is we're trying to get ahead of this to the, we probably, we can't stop the disease. Um, the city is doing what it can and will continue to in terms of uh, injecting these trees with chemicals. But what we want to do is plant a diverse substitute uh, stock of trees here so that we can get ahead of this thing as early as we can. Again, more, I think these are, there are trees that uh, you get an idea of how it kills from the top part of the tree down. You're, you're probably already seeing a good deal of this in some of our area. If you start, if you haven't been looking up at trees, Kendra was kidding me the other day and she says she finds herself now after all of this, spending a lot of tree time looking up at trees to see what's going on. If you haven't started doing this, uh, it's a little late now because we're losing the trees naturally, lo losing leaves naturally, but you're going to see more and more of this defoliation of the trees. Um, and again, an area where trees have been removed in the aftermath here. This one is, is it, this is a city of Sheboygan shot, I think, isn't it, if I'm not mistaken? I think it is, yeah. And this is on the, yes, it is, I believe. On the south side of Sheboygan will give you some idea of a foliated area. Yes, it is. It's uh, south, I can't. What is it? Tenth. 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 South Tenth. And don't blame this guy over here. He's, I mean, they don't have a choice as to what they have to do once the infestation. That's what it looks like afterward. I don't think there's anybody in the room would say that that's a more attractive shot um, once these, these things come down. So that's what we're in for here. And we've got to get at um, replanting uh, street trees, dealing with our parks, uh, trying to treat them when we can. And the resources, just as you're about to hear, aren't there to do it. We've got to get the public engaged. Um, Bob was talking about uh, Newburgh, which is an example, am I right, Bob? An example of where this thing uh, early on was impactful in our area, Newburgh, Wisconsin. Um, you can see some of the devastation of some of those trees in that picture there, which is, I guess it says 2012. Here's some more devastation in the Newburgh, Wisconsin area. All those trees you see in those slides are ash trees. They've been denuded. They're dead. They're gone. And one of the things that LNRP is particularly concerned about, correctly so, because they've been working uh, in the environmental area for many, many years, is once these trees die, um, even if there's no one cutting them and they fall over on, on, on their own, uh, guess what happens then? You get invasive species moving in, so it not only does it involve the animals in the area, but you don't always get desirable trees and other plants substituting. You get Phragmites, uh, Jim, and uh, are there other things in particular that come to mind? Honeysuckle. Honeysuckle. So, you know, you don't get desirable second growth or follow-on growth once this happens. And LNRP's uh, grants that they've been writing speak to some of that issue as well as just the loss of the trees uh, because LNRP has been fighting Phragmites and, and other invasive species here for many years. Um, dealing with this problem will help try to fend off that Phragmites and the, the invasive species problem. Again, if you... Uh, if you want to take a look at what's already going on down in Ozaki and in Milwaukee County in a very big way, or you take a look at this picture of 2012 in Newburgh, again, those are all ash trees. You can see, and they're, die, they're dead, and uh, major impact on the forested area there. That's all moving into Sheboygan County. That's 20, obviously, you can read that, 2014, and not far from us. Um, this thing, quite frankly, what's happened is, I've already alluded to this, is the disease itself, the infestation, has essentially moved north. And, um, and it is moving right now and sort of the eastern side of the state of Wisconsin. 
um, and is headed in a northerly direction. It's infesting uh, our area right at the moment. Certainly it's uh, reached uh, points further north, but the impact was uh, further south initially and is now moving into this area very actively. And I think I've got a slide, I hope I've got the one that the DNR indicated and show, sort of shows you lethality. Um, this is, I think, a Sheboygan County, these are Sheboygan County numbers, as the inventory of just urban uh, trees. Let me get the rest of these on. Um, the number of ash, uh, this was based on a survey that was done, I believe, in 2010. Does that sound right? 2010, I think, a DNR survey, and it would be general, but you can see the city of Sheboygan with their, um, with their trees, in, in a, if you would. The numbers are much greater if you start to look. So about 23% of trees in the city of Sheboygan right now, almost one out of every four trees, is an ash tree. Um, and it, we go, going back to that earlier slide where we talked about the benefit that these trees yield, it gives you some idea of the dollar benefit here. Um, Sheboygan has a large number of maple trees, thanks to what we did in the 1950s and 60s when we, uh, when the, uh, uh, we had the, uh, Dutch elm disease, we planted, guess what, a lot of ash trees because they were plentiful, they were inexpensive. Um, we did plant a lot of maple trees as well, uh, but what you want is a diverse, uh, if you would, tree canopy with many different kinds of trees. Unfortunately, most municipalities don't have the sort of diversity that we now know is important. The idea of diversity uh, and, the, and the sort of the biological interest of having diversity across the board was not something well understood, frankly. When I went to North High School a thousand years ago, we didn't talk a lot about it. We now understand it, but the science has come a long ways and we understand the benefit of having a blend of many different kinds of trees. So we have, unfortunately, even though we all love maple trees and they're beautiful, um, we have a high percentage of ash, a high percentage of maple, and the, the question, of course, is are, we, are, are the maples vulnerable to the ash borer? Not to the ash borer, but there are some other uh, diseases that Bob may want to refer to that uh, put the maple at some risk as well. Not immediately, but we obviously would like to have a more diverse uh, uh, tree canopy than we have right now. So it's not an ideal situation. Um, Ten percent Genus is desired for any given tree. Uh, we're obviously not there when we have 23% ash and 34% maple. Uh, we obviously, in terms of roots and what we're trying to do through these grants and raising private money is when we turn around uh, with a matching grant and make resources available to the city of Sheboygan or to the county or Plymouth or other areas, uh, we are going to demand, of course, that if any of our resources that are available in matching grants uh, be invested in uh, the planting a diverse tree canopy. And we have every reason to believe that the municipalities and the county now understand that point. Uh, we didn't understand it 30 or 40 years ago, but none of us did, I guess, at that point. Okay, so urban tree inventory, and this is rough, but you can see what it looks like. Uh, this would be for, I guess, the city of Sheboygan, I believe. Get, get, run over those numbers again. So I don't have to tell you that uh, having that percentage of ash trees for the city of Sheboygan is not a good thing. If you look at Plymouth, you look at Kohler, um, Sheboygan Falls, any place throughout the county, these numbers look just about the same percentage wise. It isn't just Sheboygan, it has a lot of ash trees. It's a problem throughout. In fact, if anything in, urban, in rural areas, there's even a higher percentage of ash trees. The town of Sheboygan, for example, where I live, um, has an even higher percentage of ash trees, very, very heavily ash. Uh, would it, I, would, I think the numbers, as I recall, may run 30, be 30 and 35% in some of these townships. Um, and as, even as you go out tonight, if it's still there's any daylight left, uh, you'll see plenty of ash trees uh, on on the Maywood property. I don't, David, are you here? It just went out. Okay, I'm, I'm sure he would confirm that. Not by choice. It's just it's the it's probably the most indigenous tree we have in the state of Wisconsin. Okay, some again some more tree numbers. Um, that's the DBH stands for essentially measuring the diameter of the tree at breast, at breast height. 
Thanks. As I said, I have to have the scientists bail me out here. And you can see significant numbers. This is, I guess, Sheboygan County. It's obviously a bit of an estimate, but that's 14 million plus trees is a lot of ash trees that we have in rural areas. And again, you can see over 5 million of them are in ash. All of you in this room are probably familiar with um, many of the areas where you see high numbers of ash trees. Uh, everybody here has been to the Sheboygan Marsh. The Sheboygan Marsh is heavily ash. I'm sure it's far higher than uh, you know, 20 or 30 percent ash. Those are all going to be infected and will be eliminated eventually. So here you see 34 percent ash. These numbers are ballpark, but they're, what, the, what we're trying to demonstrate is how severe this problem is. And it isn't a matter of spraying the trees. As I've said, they're going to die. If they're in rural areas, they're largely just going to fall over on their own because they can't hope to treat all of these trees. This is an interesting slide, I think, and was provided to us uh, really by the DNR. And um, the point here is it shows the ash mortality and what goes on here from roughly the first time the tree is infected, let's say in year one to zero. And um, sort of the, when, when you find the ash borne area initially, as you can see, not a whole, not a great percentage of trees uh, are immediately infected and you at least don't indicate, you don't see the indication of the infestation. But when, as you look at that slide to the right, once you get out to about year six or seven, look what starts to happen. Um, the, the eggs and the infestation begins, of course, to uh, increase dramatically. And you can see what then happens within, from about year six on through 12 and 13, you have uh, the percentage of the uh, ash tree population being infected very, very quickly and, and the actual elimination of the tree. Um, so where we are in Sheboygan right now, in Sheboygan County, is we're probably, I think the DNR would tell you that we're probably at about year six or seven, or maybe as far as eight. Uh, if you go further south into that Newburgh area, and Bob, you correct me if I'm wrong, but they're probably at year 10 or 11, which is why you see those massive die-offs there. Uh, we're not by any means immune from it here. We're just at an earlier stage. So as this disease moves north, you see greater and greater lethality uh, of the overall ash tree population. Once the ash trees are infected, they become brittle. Uh, unlike some trees that give you some warning when they're going to come down, they often give you little or no warning. They just fall and there's tremendous damage done uh, to property if it's near the tree itself, automobiles, obviously even the potential personal injury in a park area, which is why the city and the municipalities have to get at these things when uh, there are street trees near sidewalks or when they are uh, located uh, adjacent to a, a park or in a park itself. You can't just let the tree stand there. These limbs come off in windstorms or sometimes even uh, unannounced and, and uh, can be a surprising. One of the things about the ash borer and the way it deals with trees is it has this impact of, of actually splitting the tree at the base in ways that sometimes aren't totally uh, predictable and the next two speakers will talk about the dangers of actually having to eliminate these trees. Um, that you can't just put crews up on uh, the trees, e easily having them climb the trees and drop the limbs because of the danger involved. So Bob and his crews and the city uh, have to approach this in a very, very careful way so that there's no personal injury with the elimination of the tree once you've made the decision that it has to go. Obviously in a forested area, you can let the tree fall, but if you're talking about street trees or in a municipal park, that's a different story. You've got to uh, be proactive in, in eliminating them. Again, some depictions of what happens with the stresses and the limbs and how they fall. And again, the next two speakers are expert on that and I can't hope to address it in the detail they will. Some idea of what happens in a significant windstorm after the tree has been infected. I can't tell you where this picture was taken. I assume probably somewhere in Michigan where the infestation has been involved. I don't know the location of the slide, obviously in the winter. 
where they actually managed to capture an ash tree falling over on a moving car. And it's this car where they, you see this thing go right through the windshield. And I don't, I hope the driver made it out and you see the tree falling into the windshield of the car. If that doesn't get your attention, I don't know what would. Again, some idea of how difficult it is to deal with these trees once they become infected and why you absolutely have to do something with those that are close to property or can pose a personal injury. Again, that same chart of the mortality rate with EAB. Um, one of the frustrations, I'll be honest with you, that I have uh, in dealing with the Roots organization and trying to raise money uh, from uh, private sources here in the community is we are, I guess, maybe thankfully, not very far along in that lethality curve right at the moment. So uh, I still get a reaction from a good many people I talk to, less informed than this group will be hopefully after this evening, that well, um, we don't think anything's happening here, or if it is happening, we can easily take care of it, uh, or it'll be the government's responsibility. And it's in most cases, it's because we're, um, people have only experienced the early years of this uh, mortality curb, uh, but I, have said it's just a matter of a year or two before you see such dramatic changes here uh, that uh, obviously people realize they've got to be involved if you want a tree canopy in replanting uh, diverse uh, trees uh, other than ash in our community. And just more of the same, this sort of thing that is I'm sure familiar to the city and Bob Gluck who will talk about this in greater detail. So that's it. Uh, I want to leave plenty of time for the other speakers. Any questions as I end this introductory portion here? If not, I will. None? Okay. Um, Tim, if I can ask you to take over from here. Hey, everyone. My name is Tim Wolf. I am the city forester, city of Sheboygan. A little background about myself. I uh, have a degree from the University of Stevens Point. In 2011, urban forestry and forest management. I'm a certified arborist. I'm a ISA tree risk assessment qualified, and I'm a TCIA tree care safety professional. I was hired with the city in 2016 as part of the tree crew as an arborist, mostly to start treating ash trees and to continue to cut, cut and trim trees in the city. Uh, this year, 2019, I became the city forester. They needed some some more help, as uh, some more guidance, some more leadership. So I took over for that. Uh, what about you guys? Are any of you guys Sheboygan City residents? Okay, a couple. Uh, do you guys, any of you have ash trees on your property? And are any of you treating those ash trees? Okay, all right, good. So uh, to get started, the city has a tree inventory it was, um, Tony mentioned it was 2010, where the, the county did kind of a, a big one, the whole county. So this is mostly that data and then some of our own to update it. But every tree on, is on, I got a computer version and a version on an iPad I can take out in the field. But every tree is, is, is one of those dots. So the colors are different, are different species. The blue are ash trees. The, uh, in 2016, EAB Emerald Ash Borer was officially confirmed within the city of Sheboygan. And at that time, there was estimated about 5,000 pub, 5, public ash trees. And so that was a big part of them bringing me on. They were like, hey, this, this issue is definitely here. And we need to start doing something about it. And we need to get a plan. So they made a plan to, to, to handle it. And some of that's up here. So. The plan was to remove all the ash trees that were less than 12 inches in diameter at breast height, four and a half feet above ground. So all the small ash trees, it was decided just get rid of them because they're easy to cut down at this point and it's not worth trying to save the little ones and get them till they're big and then cut them down when it's a lot more challenging. So the other part of the decision was to treat half of, or roughly half, 2,400 of the current ash trees of the 5,000, pick the 2,400 best ones, treat those, keep those alive, remove 
the small ones and remove all the other ones that aren't as desirable. And when I say desirable, the ones that were chosen were, were maybe planted in better spots versus other spots. Like if they were planted under power lines, which they shouldn't have never been to begin with, we didn't treat those. Or if they were planted in a really narrow parkway where they're lifting the sidewalk every two years, we, we didn't try to treat those. We, we, we picked the ones that were in better locations. Uh, so the treatment involves what we do, what I do is in trunk injection. So there's, there's a couple other maybe treatments out there, but the best, what I recommend, what I've done prior to the city, I worked private company treating ash trees. And this is what we did. We trunk injected them. You drill into the tree. You can see up here, this is the system I use. It's about a pencil sized hole, each one of these all the way around the tree. This tree might have six or seven or eight holes. It's all hooked up. And according to the diameter of the tree is how much insecticide goes in. And here we use it. We use a rate of five milliliters per diameter inch. So it's kind of a range. There's a range of what people could use. And that's what the city has decided to use. Is it, is it necessarily the best they could do more? Probably, but it's a good compromise to try to keep the trees alive, but yet not break the, break the bank. So amamectin benzoate is the active ingredient in that insecticide. There's several of them out there, probably I can think of five, that are different trade names and different formulations, but they, the key ingredient is amamectin benzoate. And really, I've used three or four of them in, with the same results, so that's the big takeaway. So in 2017, I started treating trees in the city, and and really, we're I'm only treating the trees that are I, don't, I must have missed that slide. Between the street and the sidewalk are the city's responsibility, and if there's no sidewalk, then the city usually owns like maybe six or ten feet, and then all the park trees the city owns. So anything in backyards or even front yards, the city doesn't deal with. So. That was that 5,000 number and the 2,400 number that was treated. So in 2017, I treated 1,200 ash trees, and you can see the map of Sheboygan. Every one of those yellow arrows is, is an ash tree that was treated. And each ash tree that was treated, I would spray a blue dot on. So if you're driving around and you see a blue dot, that's what it means. It was treated. In 2018, I treated the other 1,200 trees. So that gives us the total of 2,400. Now it says future retreatment, so 800 trees every year. So this year being 2019, instead of retreating the, the same 1,200 that were treated in 17, we, the city decided to, to change it up and do a three year treatment instead of a two year. So we're gonna treat those same 2,400 trees, but we're over three years. So 800 this year I treated, 800 next year, 800 the following year. Now those 800 trees this year, you guys might ask how, what the success rate was. <clears throat> Everybody wants to know that. So I only treated 800 of the 1,200 that were treated in 2017. So I chose 800 of these. I don't know if this, I don't know if this clip is due. But basically I treated, I avoided, I avoided this, these trees and I treated these trees this year. And of those eight, 800, I treated 800 and there was five of those that I had to skip that for whatever reason, they didn't look good enough to retreat, in my opinion. So some of them, the whole tree wasn't dead. It was just maybe half of it was dead, and the other half was alive. And maybe that means the amamectin benzoate didn't get in that other half for whatever reason, or maybe it already had too much damage. So five out of 800, which is a really good number. Now, next year, I'll treat the remaining 400, and then I'll treat 400 of these that were treated in 18. And our, my success rate, I'm curious to see how that'll go, being the fact that the ones that were treated in 18 had another whole year of damage before they were first initially treated. So we'll, I'll know more as the time goes. But as far as removals, we got 4,400 current ash trees. Of course, this isn't exact, but that's the best I can do estimate. 24 of them have been treated, and about 2,000 still need to be removed. So we've cut down. This year, about six or between six and seven hundred trees that the, the city's crew did, and probably four hundred of those were ash, four to five hundred. So we still got other trees dying, maples and lindens and storm damage and things happening. It's not just ash trees that we got to focus on, but but 
bringing up our crew for the city. We have myself as a city forester, and I'll help in with the crew when I can. We have four full-time employees that are on the tree crew, so uh, there's not too many of us, but there. Question there? Yeah. So all of these are on public property. Every one of those is between the street and the sidewalk, or in a park. Okay. Yeah. Yep. The so we have four people that are working for us. Uh, we do everything from trimming, elevating the trees, getting them high enough so vehicles can go under them, cutting trees down, stump grinding, and then treating the trees with the trunk injection. And there's probably more I'm missing, but that's that's what we do and now. This ash tree dilemma has really caused us to put more of our resources in, into cutting these ash trees down because they're dying, they're standing there dead, and it's dangerous. So this year, one of the big changes I made early on was I stopped stump grinding. So right now, I don't have a picture of it, but it looks like that. Only there's 700 stumps out there right now that, that are still there, that we haven't had time to grind yet because we've been busy cutting trees down. So a lot of people don't like looking at those, and some of you might have a stump by your house, and I, I'm sorry, but we're, we're doing what we can. It, a stump, in my opinion, is safer than a standing dead tree. So that's the justification of it. But we, hopefully we, we get the rest of those 2,000 ash trees down, and then we can get back to the stumps. <clears throat> uh, replanting is another big question I get. This year we did have some grant money and some things help us out. Uh, some of that was from the Roots organization. And we, plant, we were able to plant 540 trees. And there's a, an inventory map, some of those trees in the north, near north neighborhood. You can see those are the locations of some of them. There's a picture there. One. Uh, my goal is to continue to replant at maybe 100 or 200 trees a year going forward. A question in the gray. What kind of trees are you replacing? Yeah, great, great question. So um, Tony had mentioned the the problem with diversity, and that's a big thing for me. I mean, he mentioned 10, you want 10% uh, at a genus level at the most, and really, I'd like to see it less than that, like 5%. But right now, we have way too many maples, as he mentioned. So I don't recommend planting any maples. I mean, there's enough people planting maples that I don't need to plant maples between the street and the sidewalk. But it seems like everybody wants to plant a maple. Maybe that's the only tree that they know or they like. but. I don't, I don't really go for planting maples, and we have a lot of lindens or American basswoods, so we don't need to plant any more of those either. Uh, but as far as what we are planting, uh, ginkgo is a good one, uh, Kentucky coffee tree, hackberry. Mm. London plane tree. Yeah, London, London plane tree is a good one. The oak. Yeah, so oaks, I, I've a, I'm avoiding the red oak family just because they're more prone to Dutch uh, oak wilt. But swamp white oak trees and bur oak trees we're planting. Uh, it's smaller trees, so a lot of these ash trees that we're cutting down, they're so big for where they were planted or they were under power lines, they sh I'm not gonna replace it with another large tree. So the big thing is finding small trees to plant that, are, that can handle salt damage. So we're kind of limited, but one thing is a tree lilac, they only get about as tall as this, this ceiling here. Also, uh, red bud we're experimenting with planting, some service berry, some pear, uh, some and then kind of medium trees. There's some honey locust varieties that only get like 30 or 40 feet tall. We're planting some of those. There's... State mm, Street Elm? Yeah, there's, there's plenty of elm trees we're planting that, that are resistant or different from different countries that, are, that don't get Dutch elm disease. So, yeah, I mean, really it's a, it's a long catalog of trees and what they can tolerate and how big they grow that I look at. And then once you figure out what you want, then you look at the nurseries and see what they have, and then your list kind of dwindles. But then you kind of go off what they, what's available, because everybody's fighting for trees nowadays because all these trees are dying. So it's, it's really, and the nurseries can grow stuff for you, so if, you, if you're willing to wait, you contract grow or you can tell them ahead, enough in the head in advance they can get trees for you but it, they're not cheap either 
But yeah, we're doing our best, and, and really my goal is these trees, these 540, we hired these out because we didn't have the crews to, to plant them. There was just a ton of trees. We hired them out, and, and it had to cost a lot of money to hire tree planting. So in the future, I hope to be able to plant in-house with our own crews, our four guys and myself. That's probably why we're limited to 100 to 200, because I would think we can only spend about a week in the spring and maybe a week in the fall planting, and maybe we can get 50 to 100 per week depending, but we can buy the cheese, the trees cheaper and plant them ourselves at, well then it's cheaper as a, as a cost that we have to put money out. Uh, map layers, so I love our tree inventory. I'm, I'm, I'm really a big fan of it. Uh, it can do so many things, there's so many different layers. If somebody, like I can look at this map and everything that's blue and says they are, it means it's ash is getting removed. It hasn't been done yet. There's this black wagon wheel. That means there was an old tree planted there that's been removed. It's gone. But I can still click on that and see what, when it was cut down and what was done to it. Like here's, here's another slide. So this is an ash tree. It tells me it's an ash. It's good condition. Uh, it tells me how big it is. And then if I click on the work orders, it says it was treated June 12th of 2017. So. So everything's in this system for us for every tree. So it's really quite impressive, I think. And it helps me manage the trees a, a ton. I guess, yeah, I guess this didn't, the, the slides I handed you were a little different. Somehow it didn't transfer, but uh, I'll go over a couple of these other things I wanted to mention. The, uh, so we take care of the trees between the street and the sidewalk and the, and the parks. And a lot of people might call me and say, ooh, I have this dead tree in my yard between my, me and my neighbor. And my neighbor doesn't want to help me pay for it, or I, I can't pay for it because I live alone and I you know, don't have money. And, and really, the city can't, I can't help you cut that tree down. Right? And, it, and it's, a lot of times I end up telling people no, you know, like it, it, it's unfortunate. But, but there is the other side of things, so then they have to kind of figure it out themselves. But then the other side of things is if they have a tree in their front yard that's over the sidewalk or over the road that's an ash that's dying, or it could be any tree, but an ash is what we're talking about. It, it's really considered a public nuisance because it's a dangerous tree. It's dead. It could fall on anybody walking by. It could fall and block the road. So really it's my job to enforce them to remove those trees. And if they don't, then then I would hire it out and bill them for it, basically. And it's better, it's cheaper for them to do it themselves, because if I have to hire it out, then I charge them not only what the contractor would charge, and I charge them a processing fee, and then I fine them and everything. So, so I, there's... Does homeowner's yep. insurance ever cover that? Uh, if they have a dead tree, and after it's a well, nuisance? I think, I think it's, it's per... Insurance. I know my sister lives in West Bend, and she has an ash tree, and it fell on her house, and her insurance only covered two hundred fifty dollars. So it wasn't much. Luckily, she had a brother that knew what she was, knew what he was doing, so <laughs> so it worked out. But um, for the tree itself, notwithstanding the damage for the, to the house, the, the damage for her house. Well, yeah, it didn't damage it that much, but they only paid two fifty. I don't think they would have paid more. I don't know for sure. Okay, but I think but it's they per, won't pay to have one removed because. It's no, I don't believe so. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm not an insurance guy, but I wouldn't think they would. Got a fall. Got a fall. Yeah, so, I mean, if a, if a private tree falls in the street, we'll come clear the street. And, it, and we'll leave it up to our crews whether or not to put all the wood on your front yard. Or if it's easier for us just to chip it, then we'll do that. We'll do what's easiest for us, not, not to help the homeowner out. But it's really, it's your tree if it falls, but it's our road to maintain, so we have to keep it clear and safe. So we'll leave that up to us, but the, the ordinances are there to help, to help me, the nuisance, to define what a nuisance of tree is, and then to, to go ahead and define what happens, what needs to happen if, if the nuisance is there and, and, and I'm aware of it and everybody, make everybody aware of it, and then there's a guideline, I'll send them a letter giving them 30 days or 60 days or whatever I determine is appropriate to, for them to abate that nuisance. So whether it's cutting it down or maybe if it's a different kind of tree, maybe they only have to cut half of it or trim half of it or something like that. 
you have a question? Yeah, so if, if the city um, identifies a, a uh, tree that's got some branches that are now a nuisance, yeah. are you taking down the whole tree or just the part that's a nuisance? Yeah, good question. So if it's an ash tree, I would say take the whole tree unless they're treating it and keeping it alive. But really, I can only enforce if it's going to interfere with the public right away. So, so it's similar to a property line, where the property line goes up to the heavens, according to the law. Kind of. Like, if they have an ash tree that's dead, and it can fall, it, it can fall and reach the sidewalk, then I could tell them that they need to cut the whole tree down. Or at least, yeah, I mean, I could. If I, think, if I believe it, it can interfere with the public right away, then they have to listen to what I tell them. But if it's just like a, a lot of times it's just maples or lindens that are growing low, mm -hmm. and I'll say, oh, just it needs to be eight feet is the ordinance over the sidewalk, and then they just have to cut those branches off to get that clearance. Does that answer your question? Yeah, there. You mentioned uh, treating, and but you didn't really say the effectiveness of treatment. What is the percentage if I have... I live out in Black River, have quite a few ash trees, yeah. and we've treated them, but I'm wondering what is the chance that that's going to be effective? Great question, and Bob might touch more on that, but from the trees I've treated over the years, they, it's very effective as long as it's done early enough. Like, uh, I have my sister's tree that I mentioned that part of it fell on her house, I've been treating that tree for, and that's the longest tree I've been treating for six years now and it's still fine. It, it loses some limbs because it's huge, but but there's other trees that, as long as you're treating them early enough to stop, it's kind of a preventative. So you're not gonna come in there and get rid of the bug and make the tree healthier. You're just gonna stop future damage. So if you're treated late it's and it's already damaged, it's gonna stay damaged and maybe that damage will continue to not look good. How often do you have to treat? So it's labeled for every two years. Now, the city decided to try a three-year process. A lot of cities are doing that just because, I mean, we can afford to lose a few if we need to based on budget. But if it, if it was my tree, which I have four trees that I treat on my own property, I, I treat them every two years because I, I care about them. I don't, I don't want to take the chance. In the back there, in the blue. Um, well, I have a little bit of experience with it. I live about a mile and a half west of Sheboygan on Highway 28, and I have six ash trees, two different species. They're between 18 and 30-inch BDH, and I first treated them in 2016, and uh, noticed the next year all six of them never looked as good as they did in 2017. And then I retreated in 2018. I had the guy come over just because I noticed something on one of the ash trees. And he told me it wasn't general dash order, it was actually root girdling. And as we were standing out in the driveway, one of the ash trees that I have, one of the bigger ones, he said, well, a lot of times you can see dead ash bugs underneath the tree. And sure enough, we looked on the asphalt and within a minute, I picked up 10 dead emerald ash beetles. And this was the year or the summer after I had had them treated. So I've been having pretty good success. It's not inexpensive, but uh, yeah. it's, it's six big trees that shade my yard. Yeah, it's definitely not cheap. I didn't touch on the cost, but the city, for those 800 trees that, were, that I treated this year, we spent $37,000 on product <coughs> to treat those. My six are about $500 every two years. Yeah, yep, and, and really it depends on who's who you get to do it, what rate they're using, and what they're using. And there, I know a few people out there that treat, and eh, it's, it's kind of a range there. So every person that treats might not do it the same exact way and use the same rate. So Is that, I, is that per tree? No, that's Five hundred every two years. Yeah, I just, I just, as a city, I don't recommend anybody really. But I'll say I recommend choosing a certified arborist, somebody that that has some school and some background, probably a little more trustworthy. Pesticide license too, right? 
Yeah, if you're doing it for hire, you need to have a pesticide license. Okay. So you yourself could treat your own trees without a license. You could go buy the stuff and buy the equipment and do it yourself. I mean, it, it would cost you a couple thousand to get started. But uh, but if you're hiring somebody, they need a pesticide license to do it. Even with the method, the, the mechanical method you use with the bicycle pump? Y yep. Cost a thousand dollars for that equipment? Yeah, that one bucket that I had, uh, let me show, go back to that. Yeah, oh, here's one. The bucket in that system is, is $1,300, and the bike pump is probably, that's not a good one, but the good ones I have now is 100 So, and the, well, the drill, but that system is $1,300. What's the price of pesticide per thousand milliliter per liter? $500, roughly, of per, li per liter, yeah. So, so down could, the road, 10 years, you could buy that. Bad. You could buy that and a bottle for about two thousand if you had a drill, and then you, you could technically treat your own tree, but you you just have to know how to do it. I mean, you could probably find a video. Yeah, it's got to be the right day. The tree's got to be. Yeah, up I mean, moisture. most people don't, but it it originally the, the insecticide was restricted use, so you did need a, and there is still some that are restricted use, but what I use is not restricted use. So meaning any anybody can buy it. We still got to should be careful and. and the pesticide course is actually pretty easy to go through and really knowledgeable. So, but this particular chemical is the the proven <coughs> chemical. Yes. Yeah. You you I mean, from what I I can you know I read online and there's there's all sorts of different chemicals, but I I don't know how good any of them are versus the yeah. other. There's really some that you can. Uh, you make a little dam around the tree, and you make a bucket full, and you pour it around the, the yeah. tree. I guess. Yep. yep. So, I but again, I don't know how effective. Bob will touch on that for sure, I think. But what I stressed earlier was the emmectin benzoate. Yep. Was the is the ingredient that's in the trunk injection products, mm -hmm. and that, in my opinion, is way better than the soil applied to stuff, which is. Okay. Typically, a midocloprid is an active ingredient. Okay. Not to say that doesn't work, but I I trust the MMAC and benzoate more. Okay. And Bob will touch more on that for sure. Yeah, there's a trade name for that triage. Yeah, great question. The tree so triage is one of the trade names for one of the MMAC and benzoate products. I use I use well, it was originally I started using triage back in the day. And then another product came out, Arbor Mectin. I use that. And now the city uses Mectinite. But they're all basically the same active ingredient percentages. There's some other names out there, too. In the back there. So what's the site, life cycle of the insect like where after you've treated all these trees and the um, infected ash trees that are around it all die, is the does the uh, organism move back in, or um, is there any kind of like a safe zone where you, like if you've got your tree to live for 10 years, has is, is the um, disease infest moved on out of the area? Yeah, so in Michigan, where it started before us, all the ash trees are dead unless they've been treated. And even new ones that come in, are coming up and growing, are they're still dying from emerald ash borer. So there's still some insects around. But the thought was, there's probably less though, that maybe you could go for a longer period of time without treating. But th I'm sure the numbers aren't as high, but they're, they're still, in those, from what I've heard, in those areas, there's still residual insects around. So it, it might, it's going to be probably an ongoing thing. I mean, even now, there's American elm trees that grow in the woods all over the place, and they get Dutch elm disease after, you know, so many years. And, and that's been since the 50s when, when that was around. So, and that's going to continue with ash trees. They're going to keep growing and, and dying, I'm, I'm sure. I'm, I'm hopeful that, like the elm, maybe they'll come, nurseries will come up with some resistant or some varieties of ash that we can plant. But right now, I, I'm not real sure on that uh, in the front here. So Maywood is a city property, is it not? Is, yeah. is that your is that part of your responsibility? Yeah. Uh, well, I have treated three trees on the Maywood property in the parking lot. Okay. But the rest of them we haven't treated. And you're going to just let them 
Yeah, let nature yeah. take its course. Yeah. Well, we live four houses away along the Pigeon River and probably have eight 50 to 70 foot ashes and probably 40 little ones on there. So, yeah. it's, it, what's your opinion for the future of our trees? Well, the ash trees are, if they're untreated, they will die. For sure. And they're showing signs. Some of the top branches are dying yeah. and coming off and stuff. Does that mean it's too late to treat them or you treat them at any stage? And no, yeah, so the damage that's done won't come back. In well, my I understand I've that, but so. at a certain point, are, are, you, uh, are you not going to save the tree? Yeah, I mean, I, I do some treating on the side and I'll, I'll tell people, no, I, I can't treat that tree, it's too far gone. Okay. You know, or I'll I'll be honest with them because I'll just you know in my experience I or I'll or I'll say oh that tree may only have like a thirty percent chance of making it or something like that and then leave it up to them if they want to try. Do you do uh, assessments on the side also? Just like you said, you do some treating on the side, but if we were to have you come and look at our property and give us a general assessment. Yeah, I mean, is that something you do? I I could I dabble in it. I would say I'm I'm okay. not I'm not. I have busy enough the way it is, so I okay. live it myself. I don't really advertise at all. Okay. So maybe, you know, but really, it's part of my job as the forester. If somebody has a concern, to assess their trees, even if they're private trees. Okay. So I could, I don't know if you're in Linden City or not, I forget. But well, no, we're, we're in the town of Sheboygan, but we're, we're 150 yards away from where we're sitting right now. Yeah. And, you know, all along the Pigeon River, the percentage of ash trees in there is probably more like 60 yeah. percent in most of the dense woods out there and a lot a lot of you know little tiny ones in, in, along with some really big ones. Yeah I'm, I'm sure Bob and Hoppy Tree Service might be a better option to, to reach out to Okay. because that, that's what they do professionally you know, and okay. is, is consult and give advice and, and do things like that but okay. yeah I, I limit myself up oh, back there in the back. Two questions. One, is the city, relative to the trees you're having to take down, is this, other than chipping, has the city come up with any creative use at all for the wood and benches for the parks or anything of that nature? And then secondly, is the city thinking at all about starting its own nursery? Great question. So number one is the what are you doing with the wood? Uh, basically just chipping it and getting rid of the logs as best we can by people who want, or there's some people who take it for firewood or that we deliver it to, really, because we, we can't be liable for people coming in and cutting their own wood. Mm -hmm. So we're basically just getting rid of the wood, not really using it for anything. Uh, and we, we, are using, we are using a lot of the, uh, the wood chips. We'll grind a lot of the wood chips, the ash. We'll keep them separate and use them in our cemeteries for mulch. So instead of having to buy mulch, we've been using, kind of repurposing them that way. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we're just wasting them, but... We're using that, and then your second question. Oh, nursery. Are you no, yeah. Nursery? So, I it no. We we thought about it, but it's we don't really have the skills to do a nursery ourselves. There are some communities that have gravel bed type planting areas, and I've been thinking about maybe introducing that to the city, but no plans at this time. But that's kind of where we can grow our own trees for a cheaper rate buy them real tiny grow them in some gravel and then plant them ourselves but that's we'd have to build that system and it's not going to happen anytime soon but potentially maybe in the future we might do that does the treatment have to occur at a certain time of year like spring only or fall yeah. only or whatever great question so the timing of the application yeah when the leaves are green that's what I, that's what i go by when they're full and they're green okay. so right now is really the end of it. Mm -hmm. Like there might be still, you might it might still go in. It might see if you still find a green one. If the leaves are all yellow and falling off, it won't go in. Because okay. I, at least with my system, my system that I use, the tree has to suck it up. The bike yeah. pump gets it there, the tree takes it in. So, so I and I have treated trees that are late that people wanted to try anyway, and it, it didn't go in. It was like ah, well, too late. You know, we'll have to do it next year. Okay. Question there. Yeah, do you have any insight as to why this boring insect only attacks ash trees? Yeah, I get that question every time. <laughs> and uh, why does the ash borer only attack ash trees is the question. 
And really, I think it, it's just that's what it is. That, that's its food. There's, as far as why it does, I don't have an answer. I mean, there's, there's other insects like the bronze birch borer that only focus on birch trees. And there's, so it, the emerald ash borer is an, is an ash tree. It feeds on ash trees. So that's really the only answer I can tell you. Like the monarch and the oak tree. Yeah, that's just wall and what it's yeah. designed to eat. Question there? <laughs> Any kind of research thing that you that was, you know, the trees give off uh, an odor or whatever, you know, pheromone. Or pheromone. Whatever. Is there a way that you can trick mm -hmm. the, uh, the bugs by injecting something in the tree that would help the insect? I mean, uh, this is probably well beyond what the city can do, but I'm yeah. kind of curious if there's any kind of. Uh, Done yeah, done. so so not that I'm really aware of. I I mean, the insecticide we inject, it kills the insects that feed on the tree. It doesn't repel insects. So every year, more emerald ash borer are going to land on that tree and lay their eggs, and then when they hatch, they're going to start feeding, and then they're going to die because they eat some of that insecticide. As far as something that tricks the tree to do a pheromone or repel the insects, I think there's research going on about it right now. I've, I've heard rumors about like maybe trying to do some sort of growth regulator in the tree to, to, to trigger like a response from the tree. But that's just research now and that's all I really know about it. So I, it's not anything that I've been seen documented or anything. I think uh, we'll have to let it go over to Bob now. Okay, uh, my name is Bob Gluck, and I, I also am a state certified arborist. I was, I hate to age myself, but I was in the very first group in Wisconsin to become certified. So for 30 years, I live in Sheboygan County, and for 30 years, I ran my own business servicing uh, Sheboygan County, and specifically in plant health care. That's my strength. And four years ago, Hoppy Tree Service bought my business because of my strength in plant health care and my 30 years of clients that I had built up. So I am currently under contract with Hoppy Tree Service. Their billing office again is in Milwaukee, but I live in Random Lake and their uh, equipment and such is kept in Grafton address, but it's really right on the Grafton Port Washington line. So for them to come to Sheboygan, it's actually quicker than me because I live west of Random Lake. So that's my background. Um, I pretty much spend my days consulting on ash trees and treatments, as well as other problems. <coughs> so I will not <coughs> address any city things. I'm going to let that up to the city foresters. So I, and I do not do anything with the cities. It's just all private people. Um, so. Since about uh, 99 or 2000 when the insect was discovered in Detroit, I have started treating trees. Uh, that was the year I started treating mine on my property, and I used um, imidacloprid, which Tim talked about with the soil drench. As soon as I knew there was something better, um, I did switch over, and right now we are using arbamectin, we did use the triage before that. It's the same, like Tim said, it's the same thing, emamectine benzoate. I will tell you, if you are using imidacloprid, in my opinion, and I've got all kinds of cases that that is no longer working by itself. It is no longer working by itself. Um, the only reliable way right now, because of the pressure from the insects, is to go with a, tr a direct trunk injection like the city is doing. And we pretty much 100% for ash trees use the trunk injection. We still use a metacloprid for many other things, but, um, uh, but not for ash trees. The other thing with the ash trees is the treatment itself, please keep in mind, is an insecticide. It's not a disease. It's an insecticide, and it only kills the insect, the feeding larvae. Um, and the earlier in the year, like Tim kind of alluded to, that they begin to feed, the smaller they are, and so consequently, the easier they die. So 
um, timing in that. If you know, if the ins if the um, insecticide is in the tree and the eggs are just starting to hatch and now they're feeding, they're tiny. They're tiny, and they're going to die better or quicker than after they've been growing for four instars and they're they're probably big like in those up our yeah. They could get some insecticide that way. The adult feeds on the leaves. So my assumption with that case is that these adults were feeding on the leaves and then got the in in insect insecticide and fell. Also keep in mind that there are at least four or five or six lookalikes to the emerald ash borer, especially adults, that are native to Wisconsin. So just because you see a green metallic bug, there are many lookalikes. Okay, so the other thing is that this is strictly an insecticide that kills the insect. It doesn't really, in my opinion, do anything for tree health. Okay, it's, um, it's like, in, in my observation, people that might become very sick and they take some medication to get well. Well, if you're not going to eat well and take care of yourself, getting rid of the sickness really didn't help you. So you have to maintain tree health. These trees, ash trees, are kind of particular as far as um, nutrients and things like that. And they naturally self-prune. There's lots of dead wood in them, typically. That's not necessarily emerald ash borer causing that. So if you see a branch that's on the bottom part of the tree, and I get this every single day, um, I saw a dead branch. Well, that may not necessarily be emerald ash borer. Um, I know I've got limited time, and Mr. Fessler wanted me to talk a little bit about cost. Um, the cost, again, is dependent, like Tim alluded to, with the rate and how much we're using. What determines the rate? It really is determined. Uh, it's my call when I'm on site. The more uh, under stress the tree is, the higher the rate I want to probably put in there. So the other thing to keep in mind is that if you haven't been treating and you're calling now because your tree is half dead and you want to save it, that percentage, and I'm like Tim, I give a percent, has only got a small percent. If you want to try it and roll the dice, that's fine. But it's going to have a smaller percent chance of survival than one that's healthy and you're treating it. Cost-wise, we charge anywhere from $8 to $12 per diameter inch. That's the DBH measurement at four and a half feet. Also, quantity can play into that as well. Not only condition, but quantity. You know, if, you, if we're treating 10 trees on your property, it's usually a little bit cheaper than one. Um, Pardon me? Do you do removal? Yes. <coughs> so, removals. The insect feeds from the top of the tree down. Okay? So, um, what happens with the tree is it's still taking up water and nutrients all through this uh, years of feeding. One to, one to two years before we ever even see any damage these insects are feeding. And keep in mind those, those um, pictures that were shown one to two years. In between there, it starts another cycle of one to two years. And so you know, you've got that all ricocheting up there. Uh, so anyhow, they feed from the top down. The tops become very brittle, as everybody talked about and everybody knows now. They become very brittle um, because of this, of this um, girdling that's going on right underneath the cambium like those bark pieces show. So as far as a removal is concerned, we, right now, we've got 10 crews, four people on a crew, and we are booked out well past January for removals. Part of the reason is, is because we no longer trust ash trees that have been dead for any length of time to put a climber up in them, okay? So we have got multiple size track lifts that can get into, they can get into a gate, 
and get in people's backyards to start to disassemble these trees. Today we were doing a job in Plymouth. We've got what's called a mech truck. It's a completely uh, remote controlled truck that can reach 100 feet up in the air and clamp the tree and there's a saw underneath that cuts it and takes it down that way. It's, a, it's huge. It's huge. It's not going to fit in. It's not going to fit probably in 99% backyards. It's great for trees along a driveway, trees in a front yard, municipalities perhaps. Um, we, I've got a huge number of clients in Port Washington by what used to be the Squires Golf Course down in there, and we park it on the road. We shut down the road and we pick with pick with that. But it's extremely fast because it it can handle big trunks and it's all remote controlled. Um, so, did that kind of answer your question about the removal? <laughs> well, yeah, because I, I, we need an assessment. We need to see which trees can be saved. Like I said, we've got, we've got probably four that are over 70 feet. We've got another four that are 50 to 70 feet. We've probably got 30 that are just little, mm -hmm. you know, little ones. But they're already falling, and I can see the branches are drying up high. Mm -hmm. We're experimenting a little bit with, um, I'm going to say, drop crotching, which is a, a term to reduce the height of a tree, where you, you uh, sometimes a tree is grown out of its uh, space and we want to make it smaller, so we drop crotch it, which means cutting it down to the next union or branch. So we are experimenting a little bit with that, with cutting the tops, these dead tops out of some for some people that are extremely sensitive and don't want to lose their tree. So we are toying a little bit with that and playing around with that a little bit as perhaps an option. And, and then of course a treatment, because if you're still not going to treat, then you're not going to save any part of it. Um, so again, getting on top of things early is key. Don't wait until it's half, you know, half or more dead. Um, you know, even a little bit of dead on top, your percentage is going way down. The other problem that um, nobody talked about here is the marshalling of all this product. Mm -hmm. And what are municipalities and what are private people? Uh, maybe a homeowner with one tree or six trees, it may not be a big deal, but uh, maybe a, a farmer or somebody that's got a wood lot, you know, what are they going to do with all this wood? So that that's becoming a major issue. Somebody asked a question before about utilizing the wood. Hoppy Tree Service has um, a mill. They've got three kilns in that Grafton facility. And they actually do use um, a lot of the ash wood. We make a lot of things for private homeowners. The project we were working on in Plymouth today, they're having us make benches out of the ash. Um, steel legs and, and um, a back and so on out of the half logs. Ash is, a, to me, a beautiful wood. There, it's got great grain. The insect really doesn't affect the wood quality at all as far as the grain and the staining and all that. So baseball bats are made out of ash. It's a strong wood. What, what about the, the brittleness that comes from it? Is that because it's lost the support of the exoskeleton kind of? Yeah, the brittleness is more of the branches breaking off. It's, yeah. not, it's not in the wood itself. I don't, I have yet to see trees that have completely 100% tipped out of the ground from emerald ash borer. To me, that tree that tips out of the ground is tipping because of some other reason. I have a feeling it's too saturated there, it's too heavy, the wind is blowing or something. It's not tipping because of emerald ash borer, in my opinion, okay? Um, the brittleness is from the canopy falling and breaking apart. And that's the hazard that Tim talks about. It's, that's the hazardous part, and that's why we're not sending climbers up in those anymore. If you think of the elm trees that died back in the 60s, or elm trees that died three years ago, out in a field perhaps, they're dead, and they remain skeletons for years out there. You can see them. They don't fall apart like these ash trees do. The other thing that people, somebody asked about was, um, interval of treatments. Um, 
The label is for two years. Detroit is go it has gone to three years, but it's very cut and dried there, like Tim said. It's black and white. The trees either died or they were treated, and that's the way it'll be here. They're either dead or treated. Um, elm trees, he, Tim alluded to it too. We've got multiple clients that have elm trees, but they are treating those elm trees every three years for Dutch elm disease. They love their tree, and elms are beautiful. So I think that's what's gonna happen to the ash. If you've got a big ash tree in your yard and you like it, it's providing all these um, figures that uh, Mr. Fessler talked about with the um, value to your property and the air conditioning and blah, blah, blah. Uh, you're gonna have to continue to treat that, I'm afraid. Now I do think we're gonna go to three years at some point, but we're, we're here, we're not there, in my opinion. We're not anywhere close to that yet. Um, the other thing I'm telling people with treatments, if you've got a lot of trees on your property, and I don't know what the definition of a lot is, for some people it's two, for others it's six or eight, the treatment is for two years, and what it's really doing, really doing, it's not, it is saving the tree, but it is buying you two years worth of time to decide what you're gonna do in two years, or maybe to save the money to have the tree removed or save the money for a replacement is buying you two years of time. And then you need to think again what you're going to do. But you mentioned a lot of municipalities are using that system as well just to buy. Right. If, does if Tim had to get rid of all 5,000 trees in one year, he would be bankrupt. So it's literally buying people time by treating trees and just kind of staggering it through time. Because eventually, you're going to have to replace those trees unless you want to treat it forever. Right. Mr. Fessler has got an, uh, an awesome um, example. He, he, he lives in a very wooded yard w with a lot of ash trees. <laughs> a lot of ash trees. And we've been treating some to buy him some time. We've taken some out. And then we've replaced some. W not with ash, with other things. So. He's going to do that for a long time, a, a continual rotation, you know, or or just leave them and they'll they'll die. I'm still hoping for a discount box. <laughs> 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 I haven't got that. Um, um. What about smaller ash trees? You know, ones that are only at that 10, 12 inch diameter. Is it better to just take them down while they're easy to take down and put something else in there? Because if you let them grow, eventually. Yes. <laughs> you know, un unless it's, you know, I, I get into situations all the time, too, where somebody had passed and, uh, you know, they gave this memorial. A ash trees were great trees a number of years ago. They were great. They're hard wood. You know, bats are made out of them. You know, they, they can stand flooding and water and dry and all this stuff. So I, you know, they were given a lot for memorial trees and what have you, and th in that case, you know, when there's sentimental things like that, I treat them. But long term, take them down and replant, yeah. Yeah, the river valley out here is just it's full of ash trees, and I think that they just, when it was unmanaged, and there were some big ash trees in there, and they propagated them, and they're, they stick with these little ones. Mm -hmm. And, and they're, they're, they're a heavy cedar, and some years more than others. Especially green ash is a real heavy cedar. Um, Did you know that like bottomland forest, I have one, 70% ash. Yeah. That's a very typical yeah. ecosystem type, a bottomland forest. You're finding ash upwards of 70, 80%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just helped a friend cut down 24 medium to large size ash in a third of an Um, so I guess um, if there's any if there's any good thing that happened with this, I try and look at the <laughs> at the glass being half full. There's always been lots of cultivars. If you went online or before the online days, you got seed catalogs and you saw these cool trees. The problem back then was always were they available? 
where can I get something like that other than a little tiny stick that they send through the mail? So kind of the good thing about this is nurseries used to sell a lot of ash trees and they made money selling ash trees. Well, today they are selling zero ash trees and if they want to stay in business, they, they had to start propagating these London plane trees, the hackberries, and you know the ivory silk tree lilacs, all that stuff. So new cultivars of things and new species of things are a little bit more readily available now because of the emerald ash borer, in my opinion. Um, I guess, um, so again, a little bit on that removal thing. I think your removal costs are going to continue to rise if you delay the removal because now you're becoming, again, more brittle, more fragile, um, especially if, you know, again, you got to think of accessibility and how you're going to do this. If, you know, if you're hiring a company that um, says they'll climb, climb up a tree that's been dead for a couple years, I'd be nervous. <laughs> A little bit on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Um, is there anything else you wanted me to touch on? No, I mean, I guess you talked a little bit about cost of removal, Bob. Okay. You give folks sort of an idea mm -hmm. of what they're looking at. Like 70 foot ash trees. Yeah, I maybe, maybe some examples work. of what it's. And it's on a hillside. <laughs> <laughs> You, you, can't, you can't really go by trunk diameter because a 10-inch tree that's over his house is going to cost a lot more to take down than a 10-inch tree that's out in your open field to take down. Um, so it, it really depends. I would say you are looking at a minimum of $400, and we've already taken them down um, to where they're $2,500, $2,800 because they're in a tight, tight situation. Um, you know, we had to get some special type of equipment in there. Um, had to rig everything down. So, four hundred dollars to three thousand, I, I guess. And then, depending on what hap you know, what you want with the wood, what you want, you know, clean up and things like that. Take down uh, trees safely. Yeah, you guys can charge more and more because you can. The only, yes, I, I'm not going to argue that. But also keep in mind a company like mine or a company like Hoppy has been around for three generations. And people always said to me the entire time that I owned my business, when there was a storm coming, they were like, man, I bet you are so happy there's a storm coming. You are going to make money galore. And I, I would be just the opposite. I would hate storms to come through because if you're not taking care of things and running a business for the times when there's not a storm, I think you're doing something wrong. And so, quite frankly, the... Um, the pressure for like us to get these trees taken down that clients want us to take down and maintain the crab apples for scab, the girdling roots on the maples, you know, um, this year I've seen more verticillium wilt on maples, you know, all kinds of stuff. You know, that's what we're trying to maintain trees. If you're in it just for the removal, that's going to come to an end <laughs> at some point. Not sure when, but it will come to an end. They're going to get all their trees taken down at some point. And you're not in a business. If you're doing it the right way, they have a low capital investment. Some friend will need to move. Tree top pickers are not cheap. Right. Yeah. What is that little brown ball on the leaves? I had that about five, six years mm -hmm. ago. It's called ash flower gall. It's, it's on ash. Um, it's caused from a mite that's feeding in there. A mite is, it's in the spider family because it's got eight legs, okay? So it's not, it's not in the insect family either. So, it's in the, so an insecticide for a mite will not work. It's got to be a miticide. Um, 
but that's what that is. So that growth, that's a crippled growth from that mite feeding on there when that leaf was in the process of opening up. The, um, the treatment that we do, this emamectine benzoate, uh, helps with the control of that too. It also helps with the clear wing borer, which is a native uh, borer pest that, uh, that ash trees got way before emerald ash borer. Well, I can give you one of my cards. Um, the office number's on there. You can call the office. My cell phone's on there. You can call the cell phone. You can email me. It's going to be next spring because my ash trees are all starting to drop their leaves already. Like Tim said, we are borderline right now. Monday, they were still taking it up. Monday, we were still injecting. Now, I didn't talk to Brad, who does our plant health care, what they were doing yesterday and today. But we are pretty much on a day-to-day -day <laughs> basis right now. But call now and make an appointment for the Sure, yeah, I'll come out and measure them and um, get you a price. And, you know, the spring is a busy time of the year. That's when we're doing tons of stuff. Yeah. Um, is there anything that you, and I know we're here, but you mentioned using mulch from the ash trees. Um, is there any risk of higher parasol emission by mulching the trees and using it and allowing it? Well, I guess Tim can talk too. Um, the regulation used to be that you had to have a chipper that would chip the mulch into no bigger than a one inch by one inch cube, okay, or whatever dimension you want to measure it, but no bigger than one inch. And the reason that was, even if it didn't cut a, <laughs> a larvae, it would dry out in there. I think right now the insect is so widespread that if if he's taking down a tree on the north side of Sheboygan and you live on the south side and you want to use his mulch, it's not going to matter whether there's a live boar in there or not. Um, yeah. Yeah, but also go, uh, uh, there's the uh, medium burn, the whole body that, uh, uh, because of the air. Carrier, ca carrying it. Well, I think there still is a ban. Um, how effective it is, in my opinion, I'm not sure how effective it is. Yeah. Do you, you, want, do you have an answer? Or? Yeah. Okay. It's like for state parks, yeah. a, a real concern that right. a state park, again, it comes down to resources. They don't want that infestation tomorrow. They would like to have some time to deal with it, too. Mm -hmm. So that's a big part of why that ban is. I mean, if you're taking it from one farmstead to another farmstead, does it matter? Certainly from boy to Manawa County, it ain't going to matter much anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're quarantined, both counties are, mm -hmm. but it's really, I think, natural areas that are high priority natural areas that are of the concern. Okay. We but were up in the UP this summer and they were inspecting firewood oh yeah. campgrounds up yeah. there. They, no, they, they, they have they gotten it from, mm -hmm. you know, the local area and they would inspect it. Yep. That's good. Mm -hmm. Now it has, I heard that it has hopped the Mississippi and it's in the Twin Cities. I think your map is about a year old. Okay. <laughs> I've heard the same. Mm -hmm. and I, we lived in Colorado when the pine beetles started out there. Mm -hmm. and one of the things about that is that if you burn the wood, you'd actually spread the pine beetle. Is that the case with the ash borer? No, I don't think burning it. I think it's the, the physical moving it from here to yeah. here, and now they get out of there, <laughs> out of that chunk, and, and fly and lay eggs on a, okay. on a living tree. Yeah. So in insecticide is taken up and puts up the leaves and the leaves fall and the leaves. Is that okay? I mean, how toxic is that? Do you mulch that those leaves into your grass or does it kill your grass? I'm just wondering about the removal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I get asked that a lot. And number one, it doesn't kill the lawn because it's an insecticide. It's not a herbicide. So it would not, you could spray well, you don't spray it, you inject it, but if you were spraying a crab apple, for example, for scab, and there's perennials and such underneath there, it's, an, it's uh, 
in that case, it's a fungicide or maybe an insecticide. And if you're hiring a company that's going by the books and is legal, all you know, I wouldn't worry about it. I really wouldn't. Yeah, I think I think the label says to not use it for like a comp in your compost pile, like something you're gonna actually potentially grow food on and consume. But as far as that goes, just that's it. I mean, I think that's what the label says on it, but it's, I I wouldn't I wouldn't be too worried about it. And if it's broken down and not effective in two to three years in the tree, my guess would be is that it's going to be the same whether it's in the compost pile or on the leaf or maybe sooner because it's exposed more too. You did it yourself or, or a company? Certified Pardon me? Certified okay. Five years ago? Triage. Oh, they did triage. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good. So a couple years before they say to identify the appearance of voidness. Yeah. We're just a mile away. That's great. No, they're not. They're not oh, well, five, five years is too big of an interval. Every three years. Yeah. See, I, I don't. I don't recommend that. It's we're too early on that curve that Mr. Fezor showed. We're too early on that curve. In my opinion, the city's got limited resources. Mm -hmm. You yeah, know. I don't so. Recommend the three year, but the, it, for the city, we can. If we lose some, we can absorb that. Mm -hmm. But I, I'd be more concerned about what rate they use. Yeah. That, that's I what. Don't know if they were Legally, they, they're supposed to tell you the rate they use. Yeah, and we did get a piece of paper. It's mm -hmm. treated in now also, and I think yeah. we have a piece of paper on that. That's what I would be concerned about, because I, I if you started that soon, in my experience, it should have been working. What about you, Bob? I, yep, I was just thinking, I, I know who did hit their treatments, too. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um. Hopefully it wasn't happy. No, <laughs> no, because we don't do two. We, we don't do three years. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree. You know, I, I think it's just been in the last number of years that Detroit has gone to that three-year thing, and I'm sure there's people, private people, that might still be doing two years out there. I don't know every case. So. Does anyone do one year? Or is that Yep. You can, you can do one year. You can you do a lower dosage and do it every year. My concern with that is now you're drilling into the tree every year. If you're doing um, maybe, maybe triage or one of these every two years and then in between doing the imidacloprid, there'd be nothing wrong with that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think we're wrapping it up anyhow. Um, any other any other questions? Good. Uh, we are wrapping up. You'll be happy to know I said we'd get you out of here by seven. Um, just a couple of things, I guess. Uh, first of all, there's some literature on the back bench uh, if you haven't picked this up. This is a brochure on roots and what we're trying to do. Uh, it also contains our website, and since those folks that are watching on TV, uh, our website is www.rootswi.org, www.rootswi.org. There will be information in there. We, I guess I, if I could leave you with a couple of thoughts at the end of the evening, first of all, we appreciate what Maywood has done in once again uh, allowing us to use their wonderful facility out here to do this workshop. Um, we will continue in our best efforts through LNRP and Rotary and, and the Roots Organization to try to uh, provide as much public education as we can. Uh, we would ask any of you that are either listening on Channel 8 or those of you who are with us this evening to help us frankly just plain spread the word about what is going on with this infestation. 
quite frankly, the average person you talk to in the area doesn't understand much about this. Uh, and we're trying to get the public concerned. The media is uh, starting, I think, to focus on this, and we appreciate what Channel 8 is doing this evening. But the more people that understand this and can cope with it, uh, I think the better it will be. Uh, I'm actually a big defender of the city of Sheboygan and the county and the DNR. Um, sometimes I hear criticism that the government is simply not doing enough here. The government, folks, is overwhelmed by this problem. It's a massive uh, infestation. Uh, it's not going to go away. There is no silver bullet, if I may use that term. Government is redirecting resources as best they can, uh, but the city and the county have to continue to plow snow um, and provide police and fire protection, all the things that municipalities do. Uh, they can dedicate a certain number of resources to this, and they, I'm convinced that the city, the county, and the DNR are dedicating considerable resource to this problem. But what we need to do is engage the private sector um, in trying to help with this thing financially and by spreading the word and information. So for those of you listening this evening or with us uh, who can help us spread this information, we would ask you to do so. Uh, the DNR has wonderful resources out there in terms of information. Our website will lead you to the, some of that information if you want to know more. Um, we hope as an organization we're helping to spread this information in, in the city and the county as well. And last but not least, for those of us who are, I think, proud of where we live here in the city and in the county and in our townships, um, we are hoping, I think, uh, to take Sheboygan and Sheboygan County uh, as really an example of what might be done uh, to engage private and public sector support for the battle against this. We enjoy the environment we have here. We're proud of where we live. Uh, but it's going to take an all-hands effort to get out and deal with this. So uh, we just invite your participation and active engagement. Talk about this issue so that we get the public uh, involved. This is a multi-year effort that we're involved in to save important environmental resources that we have. Thank you all for coming. Uh, those of you listening on Channel 8, thank you for tuning us in. I hope you haven't turned us off. Uh, I think it's an interesting issue, and you'll hear more from us. Thanks so very much.